All right, hello. So no pressure, apparently I'm the person who's going to get you in the mood this morning. <laughs> what a way to open the day. So hi, my name's Lorna, I'm a developer advocate at Nexmo. You'll also hear us called Vonage. We're owned by a company that does more than just the telephony APIs, so we're like full-on communication APIs these days. If you need to send SMS messages, Facebook messages, make phone calls, make video calls, do that from your mobile app, that would be us. Um, personally, I'm an engineer with a writing problem. Um, I've always been a software developer, I've been doing this a lot of years, but at the same time have always enjoyed keeping my blog, explaining things to other people, just there's so much that other people can build if you enable them way more than I could build by myself. And I've always found that incredibly inspiring. At Nexmo, I work on our um, open source presence, so our, we are API providers. So we would like to enable lots of developers to use our APIs and therefore pay us. Uh, so we publish quite a lot of open source software to improve the developer experience, whether that's libraries, um, all our API specs are public, uh, whether it's demos, I look after all of that. And having worked on both the kind of demos side and also on our developer portal that you might be familiar with, I came to the conclusion that while you know, documentation and developer portals is absolutely a science in its own right, we need to bring some of those skills over to what we're doing in our GitHub repos. So when we think about documentation, we think about the landing page. Right? When you're creating that documentation site, you work on your information architecture, you think about the user's journey how they will arrive and how they will know what their needs are and they will find their way through your amazingly well designed yours is great by the way your landing page well done um, the problem is the users didn't get that memo right <laughs> the problem is the user will follow a deep link to somewhere in your site that their friend shared with them or that they found somewhere on stack overflow um, or better than that they'll land on some mini site that you made for a one-off thing that you're no longer supporting, or they will end up on your GitHub uh, repository page. This happens all the time, partly because, especially for new companies, GitHub has more Google juice than your new developer portal, but also because developers use GitHub as a search engine. They know they are looking for code, therefore they search for it in the place where the code is. So the risk of them not ending up on your amazing documentation portal and instead landing upon any one of your repositories is quite high. Um, and next now we have 300 <laughs> open source repositories across a couple of different orgs. That's a lot of landing pages. Um, so we, you think about what you do when you, when you design that developer experience for landing and you try to bring it in to your GitHub presence. Landing pages are all about context, right? Developers have landed somewhere, but they don't know where they are. So they need some idea of where they are, what's around, where they can go next, go to the visitor center, it's very good, um, and finding their way. So it's about orienting that user and giving them some signposts, exactly as you do on your landing page. To make this easier at Nexmo, we have put together a set of repository standards. They're public, feel free to click in and have a play. I have a bunch of templates and some checklists in an attempt to make do the right thing, also do the easy thing, right? Just follow these instructions um, and it helps us because we're publishing so many repositories to kind of keep ourselves um, at the standard that we're aiming for. And it's something that we're working on. We've got, you know, those hundreds of repositories have been there a while. <laughs> They're not all perfect. But this is what we're going for. So we've got checklists, we've got templates for things like the readme file, with like, put better words here <laughs> in comments. They're not a complete solution, but they're better than nothing, so they get you off the mark with a new repository. A really important place to start on your GitHub repos is the README page. Readmes are amazing. 
Um, they're a really long standing tradition of a text file called README that you should read. Nowadays, we tend to write them in some sort of markup. GitHub understands all kinds of markup format, I mean, markdowns. This is really special markdown, I'm not sure how we ended up with this. Um, I didn't fix it so I could put it on my slide, but I did wonder when I put it here why we have this style of headings. Um, so we've got a plain text file. If I've cloned the repository to my local disk, I am probably going to read this file in this format, in my text editor. The file is on the disk, going to read it off the disk, that's how it works. Maybe I'm just showing my age. <laughs> but the readme file is also used in a bunch of other contexts that are amazing. So on GitHub itself, if you have a readme file in your project, it will get rendered. At the bottom of the list of files and folders in your repository, there it will render the readme file. So whatever's in there, users should see that as they land on your repository page. The contents of the readme also get rendered in other contexts. So for example, this is our PHP library. We publish it to Packagist, so you can install it with Composer. The readme file gets rendered on that page too. <coughs> So when you go to packages, maybe you're searching on packages because you know you want a PHP installable library, then you still get the README content rendered nicely but differently in this context. When you ship a package, you can ship a custom README if you want to. Hardly anyone does. You can. So the README is pretty important. We have some basic things that we try to get right with all of our Readmes. Give your project a name <laughs> and say what it is. I think the purpose and the scope is really important. The user has no idea where they are when they land on your repository page. They may have expectations, they may not. But telling them you've landed on, this is our full-on PHP library, you should install it, we love it and commit to it every week, it's very active, versus, oh yeah, we wrote this code for a blog post that was three years ago and that doesn't work here anymore. Right? Both those things should be public and available on the internet, for sure. But managing people's expectations about what this is, it's a demo, it's a library, it's a piece of sample code. Right? I think that is really important. What is this project? What is it for? What does it do? <coughs> Link to the documentation. This is incredibly easy to get wrong. Uh, we discovered at one point that our API reference, so we use OpenAPI spec, and it renders two beautiful documentation. And we render that documentation on our wonderful developer portal, which is all lovely. But if you get into the API reference page, or you download the spec, there's no link back to the rest of the documentation. There is now. <laughs> Hang on. What? <laughs> so it's really easy to miss this. You write a blog post, you publish a GitHub repository to showcase the code. When the blog post goes live, you need to put the URL in the repository that this is the code for. Um, so come back and make sure you get that link in. I usually include a bit about Nexmo. Not everyone knows who we are or, or what the word means. So just what we do and how to sign up. We've got a little bit of uh, like query parameters that we add to sign up links. Lots of people block them and it's not very accurate, it doesn't matter. But it gives us an idea of which projects are engaging people, um, which projects people come to that they didn't already have an XML account, they have to click through to sign up, so that's quite interesting. And there's a whole section that depends on what sort of a project it is. I'm going to talk about types of project in a minute. But for every readme, I love to finish with these two things. How to get help. For different projects, we might want it in different ways. Typically, this says like email us or talk to us on community Slack um, or open an issue. I quite like some maintainers of different parts of projects don't like issues being <coughs> open for questions. That's fine as long as the instructions are clear. Then there's, you know there should be instructions. I'm not sure what to do. That's fine. Tweet at us, whatever. Um, and then links to related resources. The chances that the user got to the right page or the right project on the first attempt seems fairly slim to me. So linking through to, oh hey, here's some other stuff that you can do that seems quite similar, 
Here's the same thing in a different tech stack. Here's the formal API reference that this is a project that it uses. Um, here's a similar tutorial that does something um, a bit more beyond what this example does. That kind of thing. So just some maybe some next steps to help users explore along their journey. For the different types of repos, um, I'm working off the basis of three different types of repos that we have at Nexmo. Um, I think especially for documentarians, there's a fourth type, which is docs as code. But we're looking at code that we expect users to install into their projects, such as a library. Code that stands on its own, either it's a demo or a starter app, or um, it might just be a self-hosted tool. We don't have ops in DevRel, so we don't host anything because we can't support it. So things like we have a little debugger tool for our voice API, but when you're using the voice API, all the events go to an endpoint. We have a tool that you can pop up to just catch things and show them to you. That's a standalone tool that's got click to deploy to Heroku. So that's a good example of that. Um, and then we have, I've, I've carefully referred to it as supporting code, uh, <laughs> which is a polite thing because normally I call it over the hedge code. We wrote this once, <coughs> on the front of the internet, and you're welcome. <laughs> it's not well maintained, it was probably for a blog post or a project for the we do it with us. Um, and I think that has diff those repos do have different requirements. For the library code, um, prerequisites, we just bumped our minimum version of PHP from 5.6 to 7.1. We know from our usage stats that's probably fine, but we need to make that super clear. That's why it's the first thing in the readme. Um, you probably need a Nexmo account. I feel that's worth mentioning. Installation instructions. Don't be afraid to spell out exactly what the user should type to install this thing. Very experienced developers are very experienced skip readers. <laughs> inexperienced developers, or normally in my case, I found the perfect library but it's not in a tech stack that I know. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna try and use it anyway. Um, <laughs> I might need a bit more help just to get it installed and like how to use it. Like tell me what port it's on. Amazing how rare that is. Um, so, just more information is always more. More is more, definitely, in readme's, because will, your developer audience will always find their way through. Usage instructions, especially for libraries. There's a huge debate about where the usage instructions should go. Stoplight published a really good article on it. I've linked it from my resources page. Um, should they all be in the readme? Eh, and next though they are all dumped in the readme, on the plus side we do have documentation. Should it be on its own mini site in a wiki or somewhere else? Yeah, maybe. Um, as long as it's written down, I'll take it. Um, lots and lots of examples. Developers read by example. <coughs> so showing everything that your library can do in use and how to send each parameter actually is really important. It feels repetitive to you but it's going to really unlock something for a developer somewhere. Um, and I think also, every API is someone's first API, so a little bit more information could just really turn on the magic for someone. So always, always, always give it a little bit more. Okay. So, an installable item, hey, I've got basically the same three things. We do one more thing for standalone projects, and that is we make them deployable. This is for two reasons. It's to improve the developer experience, to make sure that you can very easily run it locally with Docker, you don't need any local requirements, or you can deploy it to a cloud service. The second reason is we use these demos too. <laughs> oh, I'm going to such and such a conference, we've got a demo in that stack, tech stack. Okay, great, click here, it's deployed, fantastic, I'm going to demo it from the booth. <laughs> so that's for us as well as you. Pre-sales use it, we use it, um, and hopefully it benefits all of our external customers as well. Um, but this has been a massive win, and it's not trivial to do. We've got a couple of demo projects that would be finished if they had this, but it's worth it. 
Um, and that's one thing that we've added to make those instructions, to add support to the projects and to make those instructions really clear in the reading. The over the hedge code, I don't want to set a lot of rules around what you must do to be allowed to put a repo into our GitHub orgs. Because that's a barrier. So if all you are doing is publishing some code because you wrote a blog post and there is some code to go with it, there are no special requirements. Please link back to the blog post, that'd be great. Um, but we've tried to keep, we've tried not to have too many rules for those smaller repositories. It can be so helpful. The interesting part of the code is in the blog post, but to see the application as a whole and how the moving parts move can be super valuable. So we didn't want to block that. We don't enforce our guidelines. Um, I go around and make fun of people who don't seem to be able to follow them. <laughs> um, but it's very, very uh, relaxed. I want to make a tiny point about reading. This is not the technical term. Furniture is not the technical term for the landmarks in your markdown file. But I always call it furniture. The sort of the, the navigation, the ability to find your way through a file. If it's a wall of text, if it all looks the same, it's really, really hard to find your way. If it's words, code sample, words, code sample, and it's all the same size, super, super hard to pass, and especially to skip back to something that you <coughs> need to read because you didn't read it the first time. Um, so I like to use a lot of headings and subheadings, code blocks, bullet lists, anything, break it up. Try and give me some light and shade to the prose that I'm reading. Um, I also use a table of contents generator. You can see here we've got links to the major sections. Um, so when I'm working on this, I'll just madly edit the readme and then throw, it, throw away these bullet points and generate new ones. So they always match and correctly link to my headings. Um, and again, that means people can always come to the top and find the section that they're interested in. Here. Got a link to the table of context generator in the resources slide. <coughs> when I started thinking about GitHub and how it is our landing page for so much of what we do, I was really focused on the README. But as we've developed our open source practice at Nexmo and I've thought more about how we represent ourselves in the open source space, I realised actually it's about a lot more than the README. There's some other things that I think are really important that I've since included in our repository guidelines. The first one is metadata. Naming things is hard. Um, I really like meaningful project names, story-based project names. Um, if you're building an application that is, let's say it's made of Python and it uses our voice API, like Python voice demo works, silly joke telephone service, which one are you going to remember? Yeah, so I really like names, I, I like <coughs> harmless and yes contrived examples in the demos and the names that reflect that, because it helps you find that project again. <coughs> Do take the time to add a description. We're not very good at metadata. I mean, I think this audience, documentarians, significantly better than most developers. But that, the microcopy of two sentences on descriptions, that's really, really important. The words that you write there in that description at the top of the GitHub repo, that's going to show up in search results. It's going to really help people to find you. So think about what you want to say there. Git GitHub has tags. They call them topics. I don't know why. Um, and I like to tag both with the tech stack. So if it is made of Python, you tag like Python, Flask, Postgres, whatever it's made of. And then the functionality that it has. So if it's IVR, telephone, if it's got some number insight look up, if you're doing two-factor authentication, whatever it is we built into this. We like to have those features listed as well, 
to try and help people find us. If, this is, if, if I've published the code that you need, I want you to be able to find it. And um, that's what I'm aiming for when I work with the topic tags that appear along there. The other thing I want you to look out for is this license field here. Ours is MIT. If you don't have anything on the right hand end of your GitHub bar and your repo, either you didn't add a license or GitHub just hasn't picked it up. It's worth going and looking why and correcting that because lots of people will filter their search by licenses they are allowed to use. Open source is not, I wrote some code and it is available for free. Open source is, you are free to use and to modify this code. Not just look at it, genuinely use and build upon it. That is the point of open source. So if you think you are publishing open source code, then go ahead and make it open source. Use an open source approved license, OSI has a list. The GitHub features for adding licenses. This is the only thing I do for the GitHub web interface, right? I am older than a GitHub web interface. Um, but the one thing I use their web interface for is adding a license, right? Go to add a new file, call it license, and it will pop you up a wizard that says, which license would you like? And when you choose, it will correctly apply it to your repo and it will recognize it. So it, it's, you know, it's all of about four clicks, and it enables others to genuinely use, interact with, and build on your code, which I'm guessing is what you were intending when you threw it over the hedge onto GitHub. Involving other people and really welcoming them more than just opening yourself, opening your code to them, I think is really, really important. And there's two files that GitHub uses to help us welcome and enable other people. The first is the code of conduct. The code of conduct file, I think, is, it lets you know what is expected of you when you get involved in this project. And it also lets you know what you can expect of others. And that's really important for anyone who's thinking of contributing to a project that they know what to expect if they engage with this project and they know what to expect from others. I think especially for the minorities, this stuff is key and makes a massive difference. Uh, maybe you don't think it's important, but if somebody who might contribute to your project would find it important, then maybe it's important. The other one is contributing.md. Here are the things that you need to know to run the project, at the bleeding edge, right? So installing it from source, how to contribute, is there a special branch naming thing? How do I run the tests? How do I build it locally? All of that stuff needs to go here. People can't contribute back to your project without knowing how to use your project locally. I find I fix a lot of contributing files. <laughs> Not sure I'm making hugely valuable contributions, but I like to think I'm enabling other people's contributions <laughs> where I try to use the code locally and um, finally can't, <laughs> then I, I, try, to, I try, to, uh, try to contribute that back. I'm definitely um, more of a docs contributor than a code contributor, even though I'm a coder, because these are the things that trip me up when I'm visiting a project. Um, and I, I really try to kind of iron those things out for the next person that might come along and make maybe a maybe a more valuable contribution. There might be situations where you don't want contributions. Um, the one I'm thinking of at next moment, we specifically just have no, don't patch this. I think it's more polite than that. Is we have other <coughs> API standards are published, they're open, they're on GitHub, but they're agreed by an internal committee process you can't, you can't just pull request how we should check our field base, okay? <laughs> we agree that internally and then we publish it open um, and we're looking at building some more like automated checking around that, but it means that we can't take contribute. I mean, I've accepted typo pull requests, but essentially, you can't patch our API standards by patching the repo. So the contributing file basically says go away um, because that's appropriate for that project. 
Um, and maybe I should have something similar on the repo standards because that should probably come from the organisation and be shared publicly, which you know gets around any corporate signing issues at least. Um, and if it's useful to the rest of the community, then we're definitely cool with that. But there will be some situations where you don't want contributions. Don't just not put the contributing file out, um, but just spell out what you do and don't find helpful and why. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> GitHub is your landing page. If you work in technology and you publish code to GitHub, developers are going to have first contact on GitHub on a really regular basis, right? That's a thing. And it's up to you what you do with that thing. I think our practice is at an early stage. It's something we've only recently really come to recognise and to think about what the right thing is for us. We've created standards. They're really just there to help, um, rather than to mandate that most of things must be done one way or another. Every project is different. Um, I think, think if, as long as you're thinking hard about what's appropriate to your very special snowflake project, you can do what you like. If it isn't a particularly special snowflake project, then you know you can just work through the checklist. It should be quite quick. I've got templates, you don't need to use your brain. Um, so just trying to pave that path of making the right thing, the easy thing, um, it's all in one place. We didn't push these guidelines live until this week. So, <laughs> I mean, the team have seen the talk rehearsal, we've had the guidelines for a while, they were on our internal wiki, and this week I was like, why are this would be so much easier if I could just link to a GitHub repository. And um, so they're now public. So if you do have a look and have a, and have a look around and you find things useful or if you, there's things you would change, I would love to hear about that. And if you're doing something similar, um, trying to orientate users who've landed somewhere <laughs> unexpected that you didn't design for, then I'd be interested to chat more about that as well. I think it's a big project, we obviously have a, a large open source estate, as it were, so it's kind of a big problem. I think it's a real problem, I think it's a good problem. I think people finding us in a way that makes sense to them is absolutely part of the developer experience. Um, and I hope that this is an area that we will see more discussion of and see more practice developed around, because um, I think it's a big issue and I think it's something that, for most organisations, there's some real work hanging through, right? We can all make a big difference by taking on just a couple of these practices back to our own organisations. All right. I am going to tweet you this slide in exactly the moment where I've pulled it from my laptop and turned it into an image, and so in about 10 minutes. Um, but there's some resources here that I hope you'll find useful. Um, there's the main Nexmo org where you can find all the repos I've talked about, our libraries and the standards. They should be quite near the top of the list, only pushed them a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> there's my blog, knowledgejanes.net. I've been blogging for a long time. Um, and I blog about a bunch of API and documentation related stuff, as well as code. The stoplight link is the discussion of where your docs should go. Should they be in your repo at all? Should they be in the repo? Should they be somewhere else? So to include it. Um, there's the tool that I use for my markdown table of contents because you'll probably ask me that. And if you are thinking about open source licenses, OSI is where it's at. Um, I'll give a shout out to OSI. They are fantastic. They accept individual as well as corporate members. They are looking after our code and our legacy in the world that you can get legal advice from them if you need it. So check them out and support them if you can. Uh, and with that, I'm done. I'll say thanks very much.